Hello, everyone. This is Steve Gorin, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Estate Tax and Estate Planning, Employment Tax, Blockers, S-Corporation, Single Class of Stock, all covering stuff from my second quarter newsletter. So before we begin, we w wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit them through the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen. We, I will try to answer these during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or run out of time, uh, then I'll try to get you back to you with the email. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource widget. And of course, this follows my second quarter newsletter. So my second quarter newsletter is also in your widget. Um, and I encourage you to download my, uh, my, uh, my, my newsletter. Um, so you can find additional answers to some common technical is issues located in the help widget at the bottom of your screen. This webinar is CLE accredited in California and Illinois for 1.5 hours of general CLE credit and in Missouri for 1.8 hours of general CLE credit. This webinar is also CLE accredited in New York for 1.5 hours of experience and transition credit. 1.5 hours of general CLE credit in Texas is pending and we award CLE based on attendance for the entire 90 minutes. Due to changes in jurisdictional requirements, you will notice that we are no longer using automated pop-up attendance checks. As required, we will display secret words in three multiple choice polls during the webinar. You will be required to select today's secret word from a multiple choice list. Please respond to these three polls to demonstrate your continued engagement and to earn your full CLD credit. We value your opinions and appreciate your participation in the course. Okay, so moving on to slide two um, is, is the list of topics, which I already mentioned. And, and again, the materials are the slides and, and then my newsletter articles, and then the newsletter articles link back to my, the big PDF. And, and uh, it, it, you, you can, Certainly, just click on one of those to download the PDF, or you can go into the link in the yellow box in the middle of my quarterly newsletter, and that will get you the PDF. Now, I have some instructions here on slide four about if you want to navigate between the slides and the big PDF. Uh, now, you're, you're probably best not necessarily doing this while I'm talking, so you can you know, just listen and absorb the things. Um, but when you want to kind of go back and check things out and find the the support for whatever I'm saying, um, you would you would open both the the slide uh, deck and and the uh, big PDF, and you would highlight the cross reference in the slides and press Control C to copy, and then in the in the, the big PDF, I encourage you to use the, what we call what I call the full table of contents. And, and the full table of contents um, is about 50 pages. It's got a lot of details about where things are, and it gives you some better context. Uh, and, and in fact, at the bottom of each page of text, in the, in the body of the letter, there's actually a link to the full table of contents. You can just click on it and go to the beginning of the full table of contents. And then you can do Control F to find, and then control V to paste, and you paste your cross-reference from the slides in there, and you hit enter. And um, depending on how your PDF browser works, you may need to specify exact or whole word search. Um, so that's the bottom line there for navigating. So now let's get into the meat of it. So. Uh, state tax and estate planning, we're going to talk about the state income taxation of business income. Uh, we're also going to talk about state income tax, a uh, state to state tax, and also whether to try to deduct state income tax attributable to pass through business income. Now, state taxation of business income, so we've I've covered this before but I just want to set some context for a, a, a new case I'm a, a, about to mention. So business income is taxed in the state wherever it's sourced. 
So if you're the owner of a pass-through entity, like a partnership or an S-corporation, um, then that sourcing comes with it. So you may have a pass-through entity that conducts business in multiple states, and, and, and each of those states is going to collect this pound of flesh from you if they impose an income tax or, or other related tax. And, and so you need to pay tax in those states regardless of what, what place you live in. <clears throat> and then normally your state will give you credit for taxes paid in the other states. And the way that works is you usually pay the higher of the two taxes. So like in, in Missouri, we have a state income tax rate of, uh, of just under 6%. Uh, and um, let's uh, and 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 uh, I've got California K1 income on my personal return because we have a California office. So uh, California's top bracket is 13.3 percent. Um, and and if if I were a taxpayer in the top California bracket, um, then I'd be paying that 13.3 percent for California, and then. Um, Missouri would give me credit for for just under six percent of that. So um, so the the bottom line is that I would I'd still be paying the higher of the two taxes, but I wouldn't get double taxed. So we discussed before that the fielding case from Minnesota to 2018, the Minnesota Supreme Court held that Minnesota could not tax a non-resident trust on income other than from its business sources. So this was a non-resident trust. It had Minnesota source income. It had to file Minnesota income tax return to pay tax on that Minnesota source income. And Minnesota taxing authority says, well, while you're at it, since you're already filing with us, um, we want you to pay tax on some of your non-business income too. Um, and uh, because we because we think that um, our taxing statutes can reach you, and the Minnesota Supreme Court held that that violated the um, the Constitution, and the Minnesota Constitution was identical to the federal in this respect, and, and so the Fielding case, uh, even though it is only from Minnesota, it, it really is applying federal constitutional principles. So. Uh, again, nobody ever doubted that that Minnesota could collect tax on its Minnesota source income. Uh, it's, it was just whether that gave Minnesota a way to rope in the trust for other income that was earned. So now we come to a 2022 case in California. And what happened was there's this pass through entity that sold this business asset. Um, and basically, they they sold um, when they sold a subsidiary's business located in California. Um, California said, "Well, to the extent that the business assets are located in California, we're going to pay you. We're going to collect tax on that." <clears throat> And 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 even though you're not a resident trust, you got to pay the California tax, which is perfectly appropriate. <clears throat> now, the the big to do that the taxpayer was trying to make here was this included the proportionate share of gain on the sale of intangible property, which was the goodwill that was associated with the subsidiary's business. So now, normally, if you're a non-resident trust, um, you're not really deemed to have intangible property situs in another state. So, for example, if we had a Missouri trust and and um, and the trust owned a car, and and the beneficiary in California was using the car, um, then then that and and the I'm sorry, that's not the that's a tangible property, so that's not intangible. Um, so if there were, um, like if there were stocks that were in a brokerage account in California, 
for example. So that's intangible personal property. So just because there's stocks in a brokerage account in California doesn't mean that California can tax it because that's intangible property and there's no business activity going on there. So so that, that made the taxpayer think, well, if they couldn't tax that intangible property, what about goodwill? That's intangible property. And the answer is yes, but there's a different rule for business. When you have a business that's conducted in a state, uh, there are various apportionment factors, factors, and and each state has its own factor. There's several types of common formulas that are used, but it, but those factors uh, depend on which state you're in as to which factors they use. And uh, and and there is a way which I'll mention in a little bit to to avoid getting double taxed on it. Uh, but the bottom line is that. If you're using intangible property in a business, that intangible property is situs to where the business is conducted. And in this particular case, this um, 2009 uh, Metropolis Family Trust versus California Franchise Tax Board, in this particular case, there was no question. It was like 6.6% or something like that of the um, – of the sale of the goodwill was uh, was sized in California, and that was according to the apportionment statutes. And everybody agreed that that was a proper application of the apportionment statutes. And and the trusts were just trying to get away with the idea that we're non-resident, we don't have any ties to California, this is intangible personal property, don't tax us. And the court very properly said, too bad, so sad, You've got your state apportionment rules. Nobody disputes those. You're stuck. And that was a correct result. Uh, but if you want to understand a little bit better about how, how the auto logic works, that case is a, is a great uh, explanation of, of how the different rules work. So I mentioned that different states have different formulas. Uh, there is a joint effort by the states, to be fair, called the Multi-State Tax Commission. And if you have double taxation going on, then you, know, then you can go to the Multi-State Tax Commission and try to, try to use that as a forum to have the states um, get together and decide how to give you uh, only one level of taxation on the income. Uh, if you if you want to have other resources for um, somebody who advocates for taxpayers, there's an organization called Council on State Taxation. I gave you the, the link there. Um, but the bottom line is, if you have a non-resident trust and and a passive business is, it's, it's, it, hold, it owns is selling its, its business, um, then if you want to save state income tax, then you just need to go and it needs to be done not at the trust level, but at the at the corporate level or the partnership level, whatever the entity is, you, you need to go and ask the business's um, CFO or tax director or whatever it is about, hey, how can we minimize state income tax? Uh, and they're, they're generally going to be all on top of that issue anyway, but you can certainly ask, uh, and, and that's going to be your best way. So uh, litigating this is not really going to get you anywhere. Uh, you gotta, you gotta get, get the company to do your heavy lifting with it. All right, moving on to a totally different subject: state estate tax. So there was a, there was a case when an Oregon resident who was a beneficiary of a Q-tip trust created in Montana, uh, and they died. Oregon properly taxed the estate based on the first spouse's Q-tip election. So Oregon didn't have any ties with the first decedent because that was in Montana. But when the when the surviving spouse moved to Oregon, it, it had Oregon had ties with the surviving spouse. And when the surviving spouse died, everything that was in her estate was subject to um, Oregon estate tax, and that included the marital. Trust that was included in the surviving spouse's estate. 
So if the taxpayer is going to move from a state that has no estate tax to a state that does have a state tax, or if they're moving to a higher estate tax state, um, consider whether the surviving spouse might give up the Q-tip trust um, and, and have the gift tax apply at that point. So you could have uh, not, not many states impose a, a gift tax. Um, most of the states that have a state of state tax do not have a state gift tax. So you, they, they could uh, consider before making the move, go and make a gift, get this out of the estate for estate tax purposes, uh, and, and, uh, and then you, they can avoid state estate tax. Now, that may be too unpalatable uh, because the surviving spouse might not want to give up the Q-tip trust. Uh, you could certainly give up just part of it instead of the whole thing, because you could divide the trust and renounce part of it. Uh, and all the all the gift tax consequences uh, from from doing this are listed in Code Section 2519. And of course, there's a lot of people who may be thinking about doing that anyway as, as 2025 passes, because in 2026 the federal estate tax exemption is uh, scheduled to revert back to the $5 million index annually, which right now is just over $6 million, um, but because uh, in terms of what that would, would be if there was only a single exemption. But, of course, until the end of 2025, we have a double exemption, of, so it's up to just over $12 million. So, so somebody might want to make a $12 million gift to – uh, to make the full use of their of their what we call the bonus exemption, this doubling of the exemption, um, and if they do that, that also may have the side benefit of getting the um, state estate tax problem taken care of as well. <clears throat> you should know that in terms of making these large gifts for 2026 rolls around, that the Government has issued some proposed regulations that say that if you make a gift, but the property is includable in your estate, um, then they are not going to let you use the bonus exemption for that. Um, so there's some um, what they view as anti-abuse regulations that are an exception to the anti-clawback regulations they promulgated um, a couple of years ago. So the proposed regulations were were issued and um, comments um, are due uh, soon and uh, and then and they're gonna and uh Act Tech has commented on them as well. Um, I participated in that task for some so um I really don't think the anti abuse Rules are, uh, I, I would say, fair because the things are attacking are things are are gifts that are mandated by statute to get that gift tax treatment. So I don't really think it's fair that they're attacking them, but they are, and um, we're not going to be able to talk them out of it. So Actech just did its best to um, to say we understand what you're trying to achieve and just try to make sure that you achieve what you want in the right way and that you don't have any overreaching going on. Okay, um, and those and those comments came out like today or yesterday. So anybody who wants to see them, you can go to Actech's public webpage. And they have a web page devoted to government submissions. Okay. Now we're on to our first poll. Today's first secret word is tax. Please select the correct secret word below. <laughs> 
And by the way, I don't see any any questions in my Q&A. And I encourage you to ask things in the Q&A widget. And and I'm and I will, will be happy to stop to answer questions and particularly to do it while you're answering the polls. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and move on. So let's talk about the third topic here in the state tax area, which is the fact that the federal government has, for all practical purposes, repealed the deduction for state income tax. So most of our clients will have um, real estate taxes and personal property taxes that already exceed the state tax threshold or they may have their own personal income tax on their own investment income. And if they have income from a pass-through entity, they're not going to be able to deduct the state income tax paid on that income from the, from the pass-through entity. And, and that's because of the, um, the tax cuts that came in or the, 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 the tax law changes that came in, um, in, at, um, in as a result of the 2017 legislation. And, and again, that's, that is set to expire at the end of 2025, but even when you do get a state income tax deduction, the state income tax is not deductible for alternative minimum tax. So we have a disallowance for regular tax and alternative minimum tax until 2025, and uh, until the end of 2025, and then in 2026, we have and alternative minimum tax disallowance of state income tax deduction. So it's a hot topic, uh, and states have done something to try to help taxpayers work around it. And in some states, a pass-through entity can elect to pay state income tax. And, and then instead of having the owners being taxed, the entity pays that state income tax. Now the states did that to allow the tax to be fully deductible because the rules are that you can deduct, that a business that, it, that itself incurs income tax can deduct that income tax, um, but just the individual owners of a pass-through can't. So. So that tax is fully deductible. Um, oh, and let me tell you, by the way, um, before that occurred, um, we still always have had a regime um, before the, the 2017 tax law changes were, uh, came about, there was always a regime where with the pass-through entity, we have, you have a concern where you have these owners get all these, you know, little income from states, and they have to have a state filing require, requirement, and it's a big pain in the behind. And so, the states will do, will allow um, what's called a composite return. They may call it some other things, but the idea is that the state will pay the income tax on behalf of the partner. The, the non-resident partner, um, and then they pay at the, the the entity pays it at the top rate, and then the individual partner doesn't have to file in that state, and the individual partner then um, that's actually considered to be a payment by that individual partner, <clears throat> and and they get to count that as a payment for federal income tax purposes, uh, and and it it, it it also counts as a distribution to them, uh, et cetera. So, so this uh, filing has been allowed for many for many years, uh, but again, that wasn't deductible by the entity because it was really just withheld from the the past entity owners' distributions. So now you have this idea of the, the entity paying it so that the entity can deduct it. So 
what are some of the ramifications of this? Uh, you know, at, at first it may seem like a no-brainer, go ahead and do this. Uh, now, it, when you have multiple states, that actually not necessarily a no-brainer because I mentioned all the state income tax credits or income taxes paid to other states. Well, when you have these entity-level taxes, you you might not be having everything come and working out all that well in terms of the credits that you get. So there may be some income tax inefficiencies. So it's not a no-brainer that you should do this. Um, and uh, and, a, and a lot of a lot of passive entities will not do this because having to count all the effects on all the different states and how they and what kind of credit they may or may not give for that tax that's paid in the other state, um, those are important considerations and they just don't necessarily come out of the wash. Now, what if the entity elects to pay the tax? And a significant owner is an irrevocable grant or trust. <clears throat> and of course, we know an irrevocable grant or trust is a state is a trust that's outside the estate tax system. Um, but for income tax purposes, the grantor is the deemed owner. <clears throat> and of course, the big benefit of these trusts is the grantor is paying the income taxes on the trust income. So. Basically, the trust is getting a free ride. It doesn't have to pay any income tax. And, and in fact, when you do the sale to irrevocable grantor trust tool and the grantor sells for a note, and, and then what happens is that the trust gets these distributions. Normally, the entity will make a distribution to its owner to pay taxes. So the trust gets these tax distributions, um, but then the trust doesn't have to pay any income tax itself. So the trust can use those distributions to pay down the note to the grantor, and and so because the grantor then needs to pay the income tax to the to the uh, taxing authorities. So the the trust is building all this equity um, by using the tax distributions to pay down the note, and the note is a disappearing asset to the grantor because all those because those note payments are going out the window to paying the taxing authorities for the income tax. So that's really what makes the sale to irrevocable grant or trust tool so, so very powerful. And even after the note was paid off, the grantor might leave the grantor trust treatment on so that the grantor can deplete the grantor's estate and let the trust keep growing and reinvesting the distributions and, and getting it more and more outside the estate tax system. So with that as, as, as our paradigm, the idea that we want the grantor to pay the income tax on the entity's income, what happens if the entity elects to pay the tax instead of having the owner paying the tax? Well, to the extent that the entity is paying the tax, it is not making a tax distribution and the note is not getting paid down with that, and the grantor's estate is not being depleted by paying those taxes. So, so the trust could have gotten equity using a tax distribution and, and reinvesting that tax distribution or paying down the note. The, 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 the trust could have gotten that equity and, 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 and increased its value and, and, and let the grantor deplete the grantor's estate. But with this, with this election to have the entity pay the tax, now that is not occurring. The entity is just simply paying the tax. So the trust is not getting this increased equity. And so having the state, the, uh, the entity pay the state income tax uh, in order to save the, uh, basically in order to get the deductions for federal income tax purposes, having the entity pay this tax is contrary to this idea of the irrevocable grantor trust burning off the grantor's estate. 
So on one level, one might say, well, if you've got an irrevocable grain herd trust that owns a really big part of this of this business entity, then you shouldn't have the should not have the business entity pay the state income tax. You should let it continue to just pass through to the owners. And and um, and even though the state that the, the tax isn't deductible, is it still letting the trust build up? Um, so one might think, well, you should just in those cases never have the entity elect to pay the state income tax. But it really is not such a cut and dry thing because every grantor has his or her breaking point. They're kind of like, all right, we gave, we gave this trust a free ride all these years. It's, it's accumulating the wealth. My wealth is being depleted, but enough is enough. I don't want my wealth to be depleted anymore. That's it. That's it. I'm, I'm going to turn off the grantor trust status. So uh, most grantors do eventually reach that that point. Um, that certainly doesn't happen in, in all cases, but 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 it's it's very common for a grantor to reach that state where they've said enough is enough in depleting my estate. So if you have a grantor who is of that mindset that that at some point they're going to reach that level where they're going to turn up grantor trust status then we don't necessarily want to go all in on having the grantor paying the state income taxes. Overall, it will save the family money to have the entity pay the state income tax. Overall. And the grantor is willing to pay only so much income tax over the course of the grantor's life. So, yes, you are having less of a buildup in the trust in the short run because the entity is paying the tax instead of the trust having these tax distributions to reinvest. So, so, so yes, there is, um, there is this short run disadvantage to having the entity pay the tax because the trust isn't building up as much. But if, again, the grantor had a limit to how much taxes they were going to pay, then maybe it's better to just Go ahead and have the state, the, the entity pay the state income tax, and save the family as a whole in the aggregate this money, because uh, you'll just have the grantor keep the grantor trust status going for a little bit longer, uh, because they haven't had it deplete their estate by those state income tax payments. So this is not a cut and dry answer at, at all as to how you should do it, and so you should really think about overall how. Are, is the state income tax payment going to affect the current year's taxes? How is it going to affect taxes in the long run? How is it going to affect the timing of turning off the grant or trust status? Um, you know, what 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 are the fam- what does the family ultimately want to do? So, and I would guess that a lot of people are going to want to still have the entity pay the state income tax, even though it has this this disadvantage, because they w- they they want the family to benefit at the expense of Uncle Sam. And, and they figure there'll be plenty of grantor trust burn off over the long run anyway. So, um, I, again, I don't know how they're going to do what they're going to do, but it's a case by case basis. And uh, just put just put the requisite amount of thought into it. Uh, another question is, well, the grantor has its legal obligation to pay the income taxes. And now you have the entity that can turn off that, what if the grantor has some authority relating to the trust or maybe even relating to the entity that allows the grantor to control whether the entity and therefore indirectly the trust pays the income tax or whether the grantor is paying the income tax. So um, is there any kind of a 2036 issue that the grantor can give himself a benefit through this state income tax deduction uh, or state income tax payment mechanism? Uh, And 
there was an article that was written on this that's in my that cited my materials it inspired my thought to this um the uh, the article was thinking of, of a parade of horribles of potential estate tax issues with it um i'm not really concerned the way that article is um but I just wanted to put out there the idea that, you know, how is the decision is made for tax issues? Um, you, you need to go and look at what kind of entity you have. I mean, is this an operating business that easily satisfied the bond guard test for um, saying that its creation had a um, substantial non-transfer tax purpose? So, um, if the entity easily satisfies that, then you might not be as concerned. But if this is an, a case where the IRS might argue that that you didn't have a legitimate, significant non-tax reason for forming the business entity, and then the grantor has some kind of control over the entity, then the IRS might argue Code Section 2036 inclusion. Uh, as it did in the Powell case. Um, and the the question for that, I'm going to go into that in a moment, um, a little bit more the, about about what to think about. But if the pastoral entity is a state law corporation with an S election, then if you just transfer non-voting stock to the trust, that, that would tend to avoid that issue under Revenue Ruling 8115. Um, if you want to guard against a, a Powell attack, then you would try to get the grantor out of all decisions that affect the beneficial enjoyment of the owners of the entity. So, so that includes distributions, uh, and I have a list that Diana Zato put together for an, an ACTEC uh, webinar back in – 2020, I think it was, um, when we were thinking about the election and what might happen, uh, you know, down the road with, with tax law changes. And so she put together a list of decisions that under a partnership agreement, you want to give those to an independent person um, so that the grantor isn't deemed to have any of these uh, tainted powers that might powers that might generate 2036 inclusion. Um, so the question is whether you want to have a list of decisions cover various tax elections. Um, and, and I have included those in my list when I've been concerned about this type of drafting. Um, whether you really need to or not, I don't know. Um, the Revenue Ruling 2004-64 which talked about Irrevocable grantor trust uh, and 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 the payment of taxes and the idea that the grantor's payment of income tax is not a gift to the trust because compelled under the grantor trust rules. That that ruling did not seem to view the ability to turn off grantor trust status as having any gift tax consequences. So I'm not sure that you have to include tax elections in this list of powers that can be exercised only by an independent person. Um, but I'm just throwing out there uh, for your consideration whether you want to do that or not. Um, the other issue that that article pointed out is that you might have timing differences and distributions arising from income tax withholding. Um, and, um, and, and they were saying, well, does that make it like if you have an S corp, does that make it a second class of stock? And we're going to talk about second class of stock issues in the final segment. Uh, and, my view is that it's not really a big deal. Um, so, so I'm not concerned about that. Okay. So that's the the end of the um, the list of of the state tax issues. So now let's go to employment tax issues and the use of blockers. So I'm going to talk about structural issues regarding self-employment tax. I'm going to briefly touch on rental issues, which don't have anything to do with blockers at all. And then I'm going to get into the blocker issues. 
And then I'm going to talk about deferred compensation of business asset sale and, and recent cases regarding officer compensation. So this is all kind of a potpourri of employment tax issues uh, that some of our closely held business clients will see. Now, again, just to set the background, actually, before I go to the next slide. So, again, what is self-employment tax? So, an employee has Social Security tax, or, or what we call FICA withheld. So, that includes the retirement benefit. It also includes the Medicare benefit. And it's 7.65% employer or 7.65% employee for a total of 15.3%. Uh, and that's, that's up to a particular level, up to a taxable wage base, which is around 140 grand or so. Uh, and once you get beyond that, it's just the Medicare tax, which is 1.45% employee, 1.45% employer, or 2.9% total, until you get to, for a joint married final joint to about 250. And then once they're over 250, there's a supplemental 0.9% tax that gets imposed on the individual employee. So that raises it from 2.9 up to 3.8. So, you know, that's when you have an employee and, and the corporation. And again, the, the, each, each of the employee and corporation pays its, its share. But when you have somebody who is self-employed, so they're a partner in a partnership or they're a sole proprietor, then they have to pay all of that tax, the whole 15.3 or 2.9 or 3.8, that's called self-employment tax. So and a lot of taxpayers will try to do things to get around having to pay the, those payroll taxes. So they may, they may do things to um, arrange the structure of their business. Um, some people will just do an S-corp. And, and then all the K-1 income on the S-Corp is not subject to self-employment tax. And, and then the IRS can fight over whether the distribution really was a distribution, whether it was disguised compensation that's subject to employment tax. So there's a lot of litigation that goes on on that. Um, but a partnership really does tend to be the most flexible business structure um, in terms of entering and exiting a business. And also in terms of getting basis step up when somebody dies, we want to get a basis step up of the business entity's assets, not just of the um, stock in the business, but we want to get a step up, basis step up in the, in the business's assets itself as well. So um, a partnership is better than an S corp um, for many cases when it comes to um, exit strategies. So what do you want to do if you want to be in the best of both worlds? You want to get partnership income taxation, but you want to get – you want to avoid um, income tax uh, – I'm sorry, self-employment tax. Uh, again, before I get to that structure, I'm going to br very, very briefly talk about um, there's a rental exception to self-employment tax, and, um, and uh, the passive activity rules on what's a rental activity – is a different rule than the self-employment tax. So don't conflate those. There was a 2021 CCA where they, the, tax, the IRS said don't conflate those. But it also talked about where um, what happens if you have a rental and the landlord provides services. Well, if you're a shopping center and, you, and the landlord is just providing the janitorial services, you know, that, you know, that's one thing. Um, but if you're a hotel where you've got, you know, linens changed every day and, you know, the, well, I guess they don't change them every day nowadays with, 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 the, with uh, COVID precautions, but they, 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 they do have, they've got the maid service. They have everything set up for the convenience of the person who's there and you have a lot of transient tenants. It's not like you've got a long term going on. So it's a day to day thing. So a hotel doesn't qualify for this rental exception. So if you had a hotel 
that was inside of a partnership, uh, like an LLC that's taxed as a partnership, or you, you, you just had it through a, a disregarded entity LLC. If you had those, then that hotel income would be subject to self-employment tax. On the other hand, if you have a long-term lease and you're just providing some incidental services, then the rental is not subject to self-employment tax. So the CCA went and talked about when do you reach a tipping point between your services being too great and you, um, you, you tip over to having self-employment tax on the rental income. They, they, they'd be characterized as a rental as not a rental. Um, and so, so the CCA has a test, and I'm not really here to explore all the nuances of it. I just wanted to alert you to the fact that we do have a new, a new test here. Uh, well, not, new, not necessarily a new test, but just uh, a recent development in when services under, under rental is too much. All right. But let's go on to another issue that we've started to see a lot of the past few years <clears throat> is you would have a partnership and and then the you know the partners are going to have to pay self employment tax now there are you know a couple of different things that are going on here. Uh, one of those is some people just want to save the self-employment tax. Another is, suppose you have an employer that's taxed with a partnership, and they want to give some kind of incentive compensation to their key employees. Well, their key employees um, enjoy all the fringe benefits of being an employee, but once they get the profits interest, um, they become a partner. And they don't get all the benefits of being an employee. They have all the burdens of being a self-employed individual, and everything is converted to self-employment earnings, and and their fringe benefits are not allowed to partners and partnerships are take are basically they don't get a, a, a tax advantage for it. So we've seen where some employees want to have their profits and interest awarded to an S-corp that they own. And that way they can continue to be employees uh, and then and they and then the income that's run through the S-corp, um, they're they're hoping will avoid self employment tax. Uh, and that's really not um, the safest approach because they are receiving their, their S corp is receiving these distributions on account of the work that they're doing. I mean that's what motivated the profits interest to begin with, and and then when the S corp distributes that basically employment related income out to the Shareholder employee of this, of this, you know, this 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 100 owned S corp that they're tending, attempting to use to block everything. Um, the the um, the employee who owns that 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 S corp blocker um, it receives those distributions. They're actually receiving distributions that were kind of motivated by compensation issues by the ultimate employer. So. Uh, it's it's a it's a really tough issue to kind of navigate and really kind of think about whether this profit interest is truly in investment um, income that is really being passed through to the um, to the person as an owner, um, or or whether that's some kind of disguised compensation, um, and and really the 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 person is kind of sort of working through for the S corp. And and should be receiving the compensation income for it. So it's a, it's a really really tough issue. So um, so what happens with um, with a, with with these blockers 
besides going to navigating those those tricky issues uh and and I got an inquiry from somebody where they had a partnership that had liabilities in excess of basis. So the partnership had a very uneven income stream. And it would um, borrow against the income that it expected to receive. And the in this particular case, um, the owners held their partnership interest through S corp. So each owner has had has his or her own S corp. And and the idea again was to help block that self employment income. And you know you pay yourself a reasonable wage, and then you say the rest of it is is just S corp distributions. It's not subject to self employment tax or FICO or anything else. So. You know, so they did this to to try to save the self-employment tax. Um, but what happened was um, one of the one of the owners died. Now, normally, when you have a partnership and it has liabilities in excess of basis, all of that gets washed out when the person dies. Um, and let me let me just step back for just a moment to make sure everybody is is on the same page with this. So when you have a partnership and a partner's allocated liabilities, so the allocation liabilities that a partner gives them basis, and then when you take distributions, those will reduce the basis. And 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 then and then what happens is um, if that loan somehow gets uh, discharge down the road, um, then that's like a distribution of cash. So this liability is in excess of basis. Um, it'll cause what, what what people will call phantom income because when the liability gets discharged, um, they have a deemed distribution and they're taxed on it, but there's no cash that goes along with it because they already took out the cash before. So in this particular case, the person died, and if they had owned the partnership directly, they would have, this all would have washed out, and the liabilities getting repaid would not have caused them any income tax consequences. But in this case, they owned it through an S corp. So when they died, they didn't get a basis step up in the partnership itself. They got a basis step up in the S corp. So the S corp shares getting a basis step up did not help them with the liability getting wiped out uh, when when you wash out when you wash it out when a partner dies. So this blocker not only blocked self employment tax but it also blocked the elimination of this so called phantom income. That, that normally occurs when you get it included in somebody's estate. So um, if they had – now, they might have been okay um, by having liquidated the S-Corp right after the person died. They, they might have been able to wipe out that issue, but in this case, they didn't spot the issue. The CPA didn't spot the issue, and it, they didn't really notice everything until years later, and then – Boom, they had all kinds of income tax issues. Okay. Uh, the next um, point I want to make about this is that my preferred structure is a limited partnership uh, with an S corporation as a 1% general partner and individuals as 99% limited partners. And and that way, you, the limited, limited partners do not pay self-employment tax, and you get all this inside basis step up that, that you're used to getting. So it really can be very helpful to, um, to have a structure like this. So one of the questions 
that one person that a person might think about is, well, you have these individuals who are limited partners, and yeah, they're getting compensation through the S corp, but what if the IRS comes and recharacterizes their limited partner distributions as compensation? And and yes, it is true that you should try to be reasonable with how you're compensating them um, through the S corp general partner. So so definitely pay them what you think is fair and reasonable compensation. But the bottom line is that this is not an IRS target, um, and the IRS's large business and industry um, branch um, put out a concept unit in 2019 that that basically said here, you got to worry about these reasonable compensation issues for S-Corps, but you don't have to worry about that through partnerships. So, um, so I, I think you have a, a nicer... Um, a nicer burden going on here. All right, let's go on to our next secret word. Today's second secret word is stock. Please select the correct word below. Now, I did have, while you're answering the polls, I did have some questions. Um, Somebody was asking me about um, about the specifically allocating the California um, pass through entity tax payments, and I'm not sure the answer to that. So um, that's something you're going to have to look up uh, to talk to your CPA. So I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, somebody asked, are vacation rentals subject to self employment tax? And, and the answer is well, if you've got a daily rental, then Yes, I think it would be. But if you're renting for the whole summer, then that probably wouldn't be. Um, you know, what if you're renting for a week? I don't know. Uh, and, it, it, and again, it all it depends on the level of services that you're providing as well. Okay, then there's somebody who asked, what if the employee stays as an employee of the partnership, being on the partnership's payroll the same as historically? And the employee merely owns a profit interest in the S-Corp, but provides no services to, uh, for or through the S-Corp. And, and the, the answer is that I'm concerned about whether even though they're not formally providing them through the S Corp, that the IRS might argue that there's something going on in in that manner. Um, and I and I don't think that there has not been any case yet that I'm aware of. So I think that the answer might be favorable to the taxpayer there. Um, but I am concerned because there aren't there, there really isn't anything that, that directly addresses that situation. And I'm going to talk about some cases in the S-Corp compensation area in just a moment. Um, and those might inform the answer a little bit, but they're not really directly on point. Okay. Let's move on and talk about S-Corporation compensation issues on slide 25. So payments to an officer subject to W-2 withholding reporting. Um, So if you have an officer that's working for the corporation, they got to get paid on a W-2. Now, if they have services they're providing as an employee and as an independent contractor, the IRS is going to assume it's all as an employee. And you got to document the dual roles and prove your case that that there's a separate capacity going on. Um, uh, otherwise, there's a case when the person got, uh, the IRS went after them and, and the tax court said, yep, IRS, you win. Um, if you have an officer who doesn't really do any services, then you don't have to pay them anything, but, uh, but that's, that's an exception. Um, here's another one. 
uh, gifts to employees. I delved into this in my uh, in my second quarter 2021 newsletter. Generally, an employer cannot make a gift to an employee because the employment relationship makes it be compensation. Uh, there was a case where the plaintiff transferred property to the defendant, allegedly for the defendant agreeing to provide services to the plaintiff. So doesn't that seem compensatory to you? You're giving them something in exchange for, for, for services. Um, but instead of giving the defendant a Form 1099, the plaintiff reported the transfer as a gift on the gift tax return. So he attempted to use his gift tax reporting to excuse not doing comp, not doing employment taxes for anybody. And, and the bottom line is that if it were gratuitous, there would be gift tax, but this was not gratuitous. So you can't pay gift tax on something that's not, you, you know, if it's compensatory, it's compensatory, and it doesn't belong on a gift tax return, it belongs on an employment tax return. And, and here the plaintiff said, um, said, well, I paid all these gift taxes and you didn't perform the services, so you should pay, you should reimburse me for my gift taxes. And the court says, nonsense. Um, you never should have reported on a gift tax return to begin with because it was compensatory. You should have done all your employment return, uh, reporting and, and then attempted to get your deduction. So uh, anyway, that was interesting, the way they tried to use 1099 as a way around getting W-2s. Just like in the other case with the officer compensation, they try to use a 1099 as a way of getting around a W-2. So you, the moral of the story is you can't use a 1099 to get around a W-2 just because you think you can do it. Um, there, there is a particular exception in various industries for pre-existing types of arrangements that were 1099, but, but those are a lot narrower, and you have to really be careful about that. Okay, um, split dollar um, life insurance for employee employee shareholder. So split dollar is where the uh, basically the employer finances the life insurance, and and the death benefit is basically considered to be an employment benefit to the employee. Now, what happens if you have an S corporation that does split dollar, and it's giving these benefits? To the shareholder employees every year, um, are those considered to be compensation or merely distributions? So, if they're compensation, the corporation gets the deduction and the shareholder includes an income. Um, if it's just a distribution, then there's no income tax consequence of that, but you've got to make sure that those distributions are properly accounted for. And, and the tax court held that. In a compensatory arrangement, it went on the W-2. The Sixth Circuit um, applied a particular literal reading of a particular regulation and said you're not allowed to have um, compensatory split dollar um, in an S-corp scenario. You, you could only have it be distributions. And the tax court unanimously had a review case and unanimously said, Sixth Circuit, you're full of nonsense. Um, yes, you can have compensatory. And and the IRS said um, said, hey, you know, if you're in the Sixth Circuit, we can't stop you from uh, from calling this compensatory split dollar being a, be a distribution. But you better watch out because you better have equalizing distribution. Um, because otherwise you might have a second class of stock going on. Uh, now, that's the only time that I've seen the IRS argue that um, that a that an agreement that basically a compensatory thing could could violate the second class of stock. I mean, if you are trying to get around the second class of stock rules. Um, then, um, then they can go after you. And we'll, we're going to talk about the thing class of stock rules in a moment. Um, but, but basically, um, the the IRS is is going after um, if if you're if you're in the Sixth Circuit and you're taking the position that compensatory split dollar is not compensatory, then beware. Um, all right, the last one in this topic. 
defer compensation in an asset sale. Uh, and this is a really tough one. Um, defer compensation can wreak havoc in the sale of a business that's structured as an asset sale. Now, whenever somebody sells their business, yes, you could have a stock sale or you could have literally an asset sale where you're actually literally selling the assets. But typically the asset sales are done through one or two ways. One of them is um, the, you have an, an, an LLC that owns all the assets. It's a subsidiary of the corporation. And, and then you um, – well, actually, let me back up. Obviously, you can have an LLC that gets sold to a buyer. When the buyer buys an interest in an LLC and it's, and it's still an ongoing partnership, the, the buyer can do a 754 election or have the partnership do a 754 election and get a basis step up in the partnership's assets. If all of the owners of an LLC – sell the LLC to a buyer, then even though it's the LLC part, you know, the partnership interest that they're transferring, um, that is treated as an asset sale uh, because the buyer is getting a single member LLC because it's the sole owner of the, of the LLC. Now, if you have a corporation, you can certainly sell stock, but there's no, there's no, 754 election that could be done because that applies only to partnerships, not to corporations. So if you just sell, um, if you have one shareholder and they just sell, if you have like multiple shareholders and one shareholder sells their stock, you're not going to get an inside basis step up. Um, now, if you sell, you know, pretty much all the shares in the business to a buyer, um, then you can treat that as just a sale of the of the of the shares. Um, that's one way. Another way is you can make an election to treat it as an asset sale followed by the liquidation of the corporation. And buyers want to, have, to be treated as purchasing assets because they want to get depreciation. They want to amortize the goodwill over 15 years. They want to get all the tax benefits they can from it. Uh, and so even if you sell stock in an entity, a lot of times the buyers will want to have this election done at, to make it a deemed asset sale so the buyers can get the basis step up. So, so um, the vast majority of, of transactions are treated as asset sales even if they are stock sales. So this will set the, stable, the table now for deferred compensation. So deferred compensation can be a valuable tool to help get the founders or key employees to, you know, get a nice retirement payment and reward them for all their years of service. Uh, so um, and a lot of people like to adopt it. But when you sell, when you do an asset sale, there's a, there's a problem here. There's a mismatch going on here. And, what happened in this hoops case in 2022 is that the seller was deemed to have their liability discharged. They had a liability on the balance sheet to pay the deferred compensation. That was a discharge of liability, so that was considered to be proceeds from an asset sale. On the other hand, um, what about the deduction for the deferred compensation payment? Well, you don't get to deduct deferred compensation until the employee recognizes his income, and the asset sale did not trigger the recognition of the income by the employee. So basically, the seller had phantom income. They, they had discharge of liability proceeds without having received any cash at all. Um, and they – and and the <laughs> – and ironically, the buyer got to get the deduction instead of the seller. So anyway, uh, let's go on to our last poll. So today's third secret word is partnership. Please correct 
uh, select the correct word below. Okay. All right. Now let's um, go on to the last segment here, S Corporation Single Class of Stock Rules. So I already alluded to these a little bit, so I guess I put the cart before the horse, but I thought it'd be worth, since we talked about this, with, with the issues on um, – State income tax distribution. You know, distribution is basically to pay state income tax um, or or deemed distributions when you withhold state income tax. Uh, we talked about that. We talked about um, the split dollar issue. So let's get into the single the S corp single class of stock rule. So so generally um, we'll talk about we'll talk about the single class of stock rule. Generally we'll talk about voting and non voting stocks. And we'll talk about temporary timing differences and disproportionate distributions, as well as why to be really careful about the S election, but also to try to be practical at the same time. Okay, so an S corporation cannot have more than one class of stock. And that is a possible danger when entities other than corporations elect into the S-Corp regime. So let's suppose you have an LLC and and you have your LLC operating agreement and your LLC operating agreement form has all these partnership tax provisions in there. Well, those partnership tax provisions do have provisions for, you know, unequal allocations of income, unequal distributions. Um, there's a lot of complex partnership income tax rules that even if you intend to be pro rata, can, can kind of throw things off and you kind of draft those things into the partnership agreement. So any LLC operating agreement um, that that is going to be used for an LLC that is taxed as an S-Corp needs to strip out all of those partnership tax issues and put in the S-Corp issues. So that's a danger when entities other than corporations are elected to the S-Corp regime. Now, if you have stock, differences in voting rights do not by themselves create a second class of stock. So if you have identical rights to distribution and liquidation proceeds, that's all that really counts. So you can issue voting and non-voting stock with identical rights to distribution and liquidation proceeds. And in a prior webinar, I mentioned that for purposes of um, Code Section 2036 issues, I, I would rather have a corporation that's a state law corporation uh, make the S election than have an LLC make an S election. So um, you can go back to, to prior newsletters for that. Okay, now, temporary timing differences and distributions generally will not cause a second class of stock problem. Um, so long as those temporary timing differences are not ingrained in the governing document. And you'll see the regulation itself that says that whether you have identical rights to distribution and liquidation proceeds is based on the corporate charter, articles of incorporation, bylaws, applicable state law, and binding agreements relating to distribution and liquidation proceeds. So they, they call those the governing provision. So it's got to be built into those governing provisions to cause a second class of stock issue. And it says further that a lease or an employment agreement is generally not one of those governing provisions unless a principal purpose of the agreement is to get around the second class of stock rules. 
uh, prohibition. So, so you you're okay to um, to have some things that will generate disproportionate distributions as long as your that's not your intent, and as long as it's not ingrained into those governing documents. Um, so, um, and it does say, of course, that that although you're not you don't violate the the um, second class of stock prohibition, um, you still need to give appropriate tax effect for whatever consequences there are. So, in my section on disproportionate distributions in my materials, there were several case, there were some cases where controlling shareholders intentionally withheld distribution from the minority shareholders. They wanted to squeeze out the minority shareholders and do what we call a K-1 KO. They, the shareholders got the K-1, but they didn't get any tax distributions. So the, the shareholder, the minority shareholders, all they got was a tax bill every year. They never got any distributions. And so that was a way to, to say, hey, it's going to cost you money to still have shares. Please sell your shares back to me cheaply so that you don't have this liability every year. And the victimized shareholders argued that the S election was busted because they didn't get distributions. And they shouldn't have to pay tax on the K-1 income because the S election was busted because there were two classes of stock in operation. And the tax and the court said, you know, too bad, so sad. The governing documents did not authorize the majority shareholders to do these awful things. So the S election was not busted. Um, they needed to go and pursue their oppressors. They, they couldn't try to argue with the IRS about it. They had to pursue their oppressors. So um, now there have been various procedures that taxpayers have used to fix this proportionate distribution that arose administratively. Um, often this is due to state income tax payment or withholding procedures. So you may have, again, when you have state income tax on non on you know, non-resident states, and, and then the um, S-Corp may be required by the state to withhold, um, to, to basically pay a withholding tax over to the state on behalf of the owners. So those withholding tax payments are considered to be equivalent to a distribution to the shareholder followed by the shareholder paying that withholding tax. That's what they're considered to be doing. Um, so sometimes these state income tax withholding things might, might cause um, disproportionate distributions. Sometimes there's fringe benefits to the shareholder employees, and maybe throughout the year they get their fringe benefit, and, and, and you don't count that as W-2 income. Um, and, and so you're going to have those to be deemed distributions. Um, so there are several different reasons why you might have um, basically throughout the year uh, disproportionate distributions. Um, and when the taxpayers later discover them and fix them, sometimes years later, the IRS expressed leniency. Um, but because the governing documents didn't authorize the disproportionate distributions, the rulings really were comfort rulings. I mean, the taxpayers didn't have to have them. There was really no violation uh, because there was never any intent to get around the second class of stock prohibition. They always intended to give everybody proportionate distributions. It's just that they had these temporary timing differences, or maybe they, were, they didn't even realize that they were disproportionate distributions. But as soon as they realized them, they fixed them. So... Several years ago, a committee meeting of the American Bar Association section on taxation discussed that in an effort to cut workload, the IRS has cut back on comfort rulings. And what they are doing now is the IRS says, we're going to say that, um, you know, we're going to approve whatever you're doing to clean up your mess only if you agree that your mess was a mess. So, the, you know, taxpayers come in and say, we, we, we want to change our procedures, come clean, and, 
and 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 have procedures that you IRS agree will work. And and the IRS would say, well, um, maybe your procedures were okay. Uh, I, you know, maybe they weren't. Uh, I'm not going to really tell you that they were wrong. Um, and so I'm not going to give you what we call inadvertent termination release. I'm not going to say, well, you inadvertently busted your S election, but I'm going to retroactively bless it um, because you didn't necessarily do anything wrong. And the taxpayers are like, yeah, but I don't know what the answer is. You don't know what the answer is. Some buyer might get concerned that we busted the S election, and I want to, I want to be sure. I want to have comfort for it. And so the IRS said, okay, if you represent that whatever you did caused a second class of stock, then we will tell you it was an inadvertent termination. So that's what happens is that the taxpayer will represent that their disproportionate distributions but of the S election. So what happens is, is that there's this pattern. The taxpayer makes a representation that disproportionate distributions busted the S election, then the IRS says, well, if you say so, yes, it busted it, because you said so. The, you represented the bust of your S election, we're going to take your word for it. So this ruling that the that a violation occurred doesn't indicate the IRS's view, but rather it demonstrates this game of avoiding a comfort ruling, because the IRS is not really saying that a violation occurs. They're just accepting the taxpayer's representation that one occurred. So um, they can be unsettling if you don't know what's going on here. But when you know what's going on here, um, that that the that the it's really kind of a made up uh, busting of the S election, um, and because the taxpayers just want to get this comfort, um, if, if if you know that the that that it really is not a busting of the election, but just something to give taxpayers comfort when they figured out they had a problem and want to fix, they want to get IRS blessing, um, then you might not be as concerned with some of these recent rulings. So always always look to see whether the taxpayer represented that the disproportionate distribution was a busting of the S election um, or whether the IRS itself actually said it was. And you'll find like every single time that the taxpayer is representing that, you, that they busted the S election. So um, why do you want to be really careful about this, um, about, about whether you did bust the S election or not? Um, and that is uh, if you have a strategic buyer and they're going to pay, you know, like two or three or four times or even more what the company is worth to you um, operating on your own, your strategic buyer says, I want to buy you out and, and I'm going to combine with my business and get all these synergies and, and really – make a ton of money off of it. So a strategic buyer comes in, and if the strategic buyer is concerned that there's a fault with the S election, they may say, well, we want you to go get a private letter ruling. What private letter rulings, the IRS will tell you, they, they, they target those for a six-month completion date. Well, in six months, your deal can fall apart. So we really want to protect the S election um, not because we're it's concerned about an IRS audit, but because we're concerned about a strategic buyer um, wanting to delay the deal. So let's just get get real here. What practical steps um, should a corporation take when it's confronted with the messy reality that causes the temporary timing differences? So my answer is we want to keep the governing documents pristine. If there are some timing differences, we do not want those ingrained in the governing documents. Because that's where you can cause a violation. So don't formally adopt legally binding agreements that cause those differences. <clears throat> now, um, you know, sometimes you, you're you going to have some type of agreement that will generate those issues anyway. So employment agreements or similar agreements might generate them. So, like, for example, if you went to the split dollar 
and the split dollar was a deem distribution. And well, you know, when is that split dollar payment recognized? And are you going to watch out for the timing of that split dollar payment and make sure you make a distribution at exactly the time that that payment is deemed made for purposes of the split dollar rules? Um, you know, that, that might not be practical. There may be other things in employment agreements that will cause these temporary timing differences. And, and again, there, you're going you're gonna to true it up. You're, you're going to give everybody e equivalent distributions anyway. Um, but so, 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 you know, don't, don't get overly excited. But what you want to do is you want to take a really practical approach. Um, and, and, and here's my view. I, I mean, I don't know if any law directly on point, um, but here's a procedure and then I'm going to explain why I think it's okay. So the first bullet point is make sure that any timing differences that remain at year end are caught um, either during year end or um, during the tax return prep. And and so tax return preparation is kind of your last your last shot at that year to try to kind of, you know, you take a review of that year and see what it, what it looks like. And, and have you inadvertently made disproportionate distributions? Well, the IRS isn't going to audit you before you file the tax return. Uh, and, and certainly they're not going to audit you within a week or two of filing your tax return or probably even a month or two or probably even several months or maybe even a year or two. Um, but... So, so you, you, you do the tax return and then just see how things are coming out. And if there were some, some disproportionate distributions, then just do a makeup and get everybody brought back into line from a, a proportionality viewpoint so that overall the distributions for that year all added up in the aggregate to be proportionate. So... I think that if you do that, then then I would not be concerned about the temporary timing differences, and 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 why why is that? So um, let's look at what, what I mentioned before about about when I when I read the regulation out to you, it said that if you have these leases or employment agreements or stuff like that. And and they're not intended to avoid the second class of stock rule, then they're not going to be treated as governing documents. So the process that I suggested would demonstrate that the taxpayer did not and does not intend to circumvent the second class of stock prohibition. I mean, the taxpayer is every year methodically trying to make sure that distributions for that year came out right. So how can you be saying that you're intending to give different rights that are disproportionate if every year you're chewing it up and making everybody proportionate? So, so I think I think that doing this tuning up at the year end um, is going to be fine. Um, again, as long as you don't put it into something that's specifically a governing document. If, if it's the result, if it's a byproduct of some other ancillary things like leases and employment agreements, then fine. But don't just, just don't put the timing differences into, into those other documents. So um, I do talk about extra steps to safeguard S election uh, and, and with a strategic buyer, um, but um, there, there, there is actually a workaround when you're selling to a strategic buyer. Um, it, it might add an extra day to the transaction, but that's about all it would add. So most people don't want to have to do the workaround, um, but um, they, they'd rather be safe. But, um, but I think this is a case where you can just be practical and don't let paranoia dominate over a practical good faith approach. Uh, Cause I think you're in pretty solid ground when you're not 
it's not in the governing documents, and you're religiously trying to get these um, the disproportionate distributions cured. So uh, my conclusion slide gives you a bunch of, of resources. Um, anybody who is a CPA can get CPE through CPA Academy, uh, and I do this through, through, that, through that as well. Um, and I have other things you can you can um, subscribe to. My my, my next uh, you know, my third quarter newsletter will be out in October, and October 25th is the schedule for my next my third quarter newsletter. And there's also a link to get other free Thompson and Cobra resources. So uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, and I know I went quickly, and I covered a lot of advanced topics. I hope I didn't leave uh, leave you behind for any of these. Um, I hope you really benefited from this for your practice. Um, thank you for participating in our webinar. Uh, please complete and submit the survey that we'll display at the conclusion. Thank you very much. Look forward to future contact with you.